Hey folks, Dr. Mike Digital here for RP Plus, RPU, Renaissance Periodization, and the emotion of anger, which is typified by the miniature dachshund as an animal. If you ever meet a miniature dachshund, don't assume you can just pet them because sometimes they get snappy, just like that. They bare the teeth. Scary. Luckily, we're not talking about miniature dachshunds. We are doing hypertrophy, advanced concept and tools, lecture number nine, progression within a mesocycle, specific instructions and theoretical directions as to how to progress within a mesocycle for muscle growth. So first we're gonna talk about why we're interested in progression at all in such a level of detail, the purpose of a progression, which is oftentimes forgotten or confused, talk about which variables we're gonna progress in, that we're gonna address all three progression variables, implications for training and programming recommendations. Why are we interested in the details of a progression? Well, uh, let's say we have the perfect workout. It's only perfect once because the human body adapts and even after uh, you know any given stimulus is presented, our physiology changes even if it's just a little, right? So for the next session to be as close to optimal as possible, we probably have to change some things. A lot of times it means doing more. It's not indefinite because we have to have deloads and so on and so forth, but a little bit more of something makes sure that we're on track to still get the best and the best and the best possible stimulus, right? If we undershoot this idea of more and just do way less than we have to, then we just leave gains on the table. Like you've just been for weeks and weeks training way easier than you should have been. If we overshoot more, it's cool. We might get some good gains, but we accumulate so much fatigue so fast that our men's cycle ends up being really short. We have to deal with super often. It's not the best use of our time. It's also a little bit risky for injury. Um, and if we progress on the wrong variable, we'll make it suboptimal gains. For example, uh, just real quick, and this gets a little technical, but most of you folks are up to speed on this. If you only ever add sets, but you never add rep, reps or weight, the reps in reserve for all the sets starts to go up and up and up to where you're doing like 20 sets, 10 RIR by the end of your muscle cycle. It's just like a fundamentally crappy stimulus to fatigue ratio because you're doing all this work for not much growth whatsoever relative to how much work you're doing. So how you progress, not just that you progress, is also important. So the purpose of a progression, what's the point of a progression? It's uh, to have good training. What is good training? Good training stimulates the most growth that we can per session, which is good per session, but it isn't so much training that the next session won't be possible. So there's really a two-factor analysis that we have to apply to how do we have a great session. Does it check the box for growing muscle today? Yes. And does it set us up in such a way that we can grow muscle in the next session as well? Okay. And all sessions, but the last one of a muscle cycle or last of accumulation phase, which is who cares? We have deload, have to ask both questions. Because you can honestly say like, how do you get the most growth in one session? You do just as much as you sort of can uh, close to recover from. You go right to your maximum adaptive volume, just a little bit over even for an overreaching effect. The problem is you can't sustainably do that multiple sessions in a row. We don't, it's almost like this, if you're gaining weight and you have to plan out all six meals and there's really all six meals are really pretty big, you have to eat just enough food in every single meal to eat it, really challenge yourself, really get full, but be just hungry enough for the next meal to still be able to eat it. Like if you double the food in the first meal, you'll have to skip your second meal and then you'll have to eat double again. And then you'll almost certainly not be able to do that. And then you're really behind. And by the time you get to the evening, you're supposed to just have one meal. You're behind like three meals or something like that. It's just not sustainable. You, you have to give up on your plan, right? Same kind of idea. If you start with too much volume or too much load or too many reps, um, another problem is you get probably too much damage to get your best growth uh, because there's, you're now you're above your maximum adaptive volume. And you might only be able to do like one or two more sessions before you have to deload. What kind of hypertrophy program is that? We do two hard workouts and then a deload. Two hard workouts and then a deload. That's kind of crazy. Uh, you know, you're essentially deloading a third of the year if you look at it that way. Not the best way to grow muscle in, in most cases. On the other hand, you could say, I want to play it really easy. And you start with very little volume load and reps. Then, you know, it's under stimulative by long shot. You're just not growing much muscle, if at all. And if you say, okay, damn it, I, I undershot. Let me get into the volume that's going to be really stimulative. You have to make a big jump, right? And big jumps are risky from an injury perspective. So we have every sort of incentive to make sure 
that we get our progression well so we can slowly ease in and all the time they'll more and more of our program until the fatigue is too high we deload and then we repeat right so we could say that training in week one of a program gives us good uh, acute growth stimulus and we're also able it gives us enough volume and intensity and uh sorry enough volume and load and reps to give us a good acute growth stimulus and enough of all of those things, but not so many, so that we can continue to progress for another, oh, three to six weeks from here without prohibitive fatigue accumulation cutting off our progress, right? Uh, a, a easy analogy for, to this, in addition to the eating food analogy, is um, uh, how fast should a marathon runner run the first mile of the 26.2 miles of his race? Um, fast enough to stay on pace, uh, to make, meet his uh, timelines that he wants to sort of beat everyone, right? That's the equivalent of a good acute growth stimulus, right? Check mark that. I'm running fast enough to get good results in the race, but not so. Because if, if you say that, you could just run real fast. <laughs> you could start sprinting and oh shit, you'll be way ahead of the pack. But the consideration is and slow enough so that I can go 26.2 miles without a prohibitive amount of fatigue accumulation and just falling over. Same idea. And, you know, people say, you know, uh, training is a sprint, life is a sprint, not a marathon. Like there's some wisdom to that, right? Hypertrophy training is uh, not a sprint, it is a marathon. And weeks and weeks and weeks of training, any one training session can't be so crazy as to prohibit all the others, right? If we take a bit of an algebraic mathematical approach, we can say, you know, so training in week one was the first one on the slide. What about training in week N minus X? Oh, holy shit, math, I didn't sign up for this. You sure as hell did, this is RP plus, all right? We're some brainy motherfuckers in here. So N, is the total uh, number of weeks in accumulation, right? So let's say eight, uh, like we're planning on eight weeks of accumulation uh, before a deload week. And then X is the remaining weeks we have left in accumulation, right? So N minus X would be like, let's say it's eight minus six. So that basically means we're at week number two. So training in week two is good acute growth stimulus for that week. Okay, we have to make sure we check that box and can continue to progress for another X weeks, in that case, six weeks, right? From here without prohibitive fatigue accumulation. Because you can always turn up the volume and be like, well, I can survive another week like this, but who cares? You're trying to survive for eight, right? It doesn't make sense to go balls to the wall and have to deal it all the time, right? From this situation, we know that if we start to hit very low reps in reserve or go to failure, we uh, fatigue spikes like crazy and we probably have to deal with the next week. So we can surmise that reps in reserve will usually either stay stable or fall on any given week in most weeks of training, right? Uh, RIR reductions cause growth. Every time you let do less RIR for that session, like closer to failure, you cause more hypertrophy, but they also sap sustainability, which is okay if you're in the last week. So basically, you start a mesocycle at three or four reps in reserve, and as you progress through the mesocycle, your reps in reserve go down to zero or one, and then you deal it and repeat, right? So how many reps in reserve should you be shooting for two weeks out of the last? Well, you know, RIR two, RIR one, something like that. If you're at four reps in reserve and you're two weeks until you're done with your program, you've just been undershooting like crazy, right? And if you are going to failure and you have three weeks left of your program, how are you supposed to manage an overload with such an unbelievable amount of cumulative fatigue? You won't be able to do it, right? So we can say RIR usually fall as most weeks of training go. So we can simplify all this and condense it to say the purpose of progression is to hit enough volume to meet the growth needs for this session, but stay shy enough of MRV to continue progression on track and hit the target reps in reserve for that week. And in most weeks, it's either going to be stable or decline. It's never going to go up. Okay, and imagine week one, you hit three RIR. Week two, you hit four RIR. Like, where are you going to use? Is it going to go easier and easier and easier until you quit training? Of course not, right? So you got to either decline an RIR or either stay stable sometimes. Okay, so that is the purpose of progression. By purpose of progression, we mean that's the goal we want as folks that are training ourselves. We want to hit enough volume to meet growth needs, but make sure we're pretty far from uh, MRV concomitantly far from MRV as we get uh, further and further away from the last week of our training cycle. So as we get closer to our training cycle, we get closer and closer to MRV. And also every single one of those weeks, we want to hit approximately the RR that is the target anywhere between three or four RR when we start and zero or one RR when we end. So as we go and say every two weeks, then we say, you know, RR three for two weeks, RR two for two weeks, RER one for two weeks, RER zero for a week, and then that ends. That's like a seven-week accumulation. Or it's just one week at a time, and it's a four-week accumulation, something like that. The details 
not overly important. Now, we know that's the purpose of progression. Which variables do we change? Okay, so again, super quick review. Hit enough volume to meet growth needs for the session. Stay shy enough of MRV to continue the progression as planned and hit target RIR. The volume is easy because we just do that through sets. So when it says hit enough volume to meet growth needs, number of sets. And we're going to titrate our number of sets. We'll have a formula for it later, an algorithm. What about uh, hitting the RIR? Well, we can hit RIR either through progressing in load or progressing in repetitions. In other words, adding weight to the bar or adding reps to the bar. When are load and rep uh, additions appropriate? We're going to zoom in a little bit and talk about some specific times where one is better than the other. Generally speaking, as long as you're doing hard sets, that is, as long as you're hitting the reps in reserve that you need, there's very little difference in all likelihood between progressing by load and progressing by reps. So one versus the other, they're both great tools. Sometimes one is better than the other. We'll get to that in just a sec. We'll start with progressions in load. Here's the deal. Why do we progress in load? Again, it's to hit the RIRs. That's it, right? If you don't add something, RIR will go up or stall for too long. For example, let's say you do a set of 10 with 100 kilos in the squat or something like that, whatever exercise. Set of 10 with 100 kilos in week one at three reps in reserve. So you could have done 13 reps, right? If you do the same set of 10 at 100 kilos in week two, you got stronger, your work capacity improved, your neurology improved. So all of a sudden now it's a four rep in reserve set. You're up to 14 reps potentially if you wanted to. That's not good. That is not an increase in stimulus. That is a decrease in stimulus. That's going the wrong way. That's further away from optimal training, right? So ideally we should be aiming for at least three RIR in that next week and possibly even two RIR. So how do we mitigate that? Well, instead of doing hundred kilos that second week, we go to 102.5 kilos, right? And then same, we hit it for 10, right? And then that's a three RIR, or we can even go to 105 kilos in the second week, and that's a two RIR. Perfect. Either way, depending on if we want a longer or shorter accumulation, which is just some, you know, pluses and minuses to both, we're uh, basically, uh, one of those is, uh, they're both totally cool, and they're both meeting that uh, check mark of at least RIR stable, probably RIRs fall, right? Super, super good stuff. And for hitting target RIRs, load additions are excellent. They're super excellent. Um, in some senses, they're mandatory. So remember that our bottom end of the hypertrophy stimulus range is, uh, or overload range is probably 30% or so of one rep max. So you could say, you know, I'm never going to add any weight. I'm always going to add reps until you're doing reps of 30 plus every set, then it's probably too light, then you have to add weight. So they're mandatory when load is at 30% one RM or lower. So for example, on lat pull downs, you do 100 pounds for a set of 30. Next week, you're not going to do a set of 31 or 32. You're going to do more, maybe 110 pounds for a set of 26 or something like that, right? Something more challenging that brings you back into that range. Also, they're highly recommended, but not mandatory if in your case, rep additions would leave the target rep range away. So for example, you are uh, trying to work in the 15 to 20 rep range on purpose for a certain exercise and you reach 20 reps in that exercise because you've been adding reps. Next week, you have to add something. Do you add a rep and go to 21 reps? Well, that's not in the 15 to 20 range anymore. So you probably want to add weight to the bar to keep that in the 15 to 20 range. An even better way to stay in the 15 to 20 range if you can is to never add weight at all is to do like 17 reps on the first set, okay? And then add weight every single week by a little bit to just stay at 17 reps and have the RRR fall. That's awesome because you're getting right in the middle of that range exactly how you want. Um, that being said, uh, there's a very good chance that weight additions are not magically better than rep additions. Um, there's going to be a study that um, uh, some colleagues and I are uh, executing together, a uh, formal university study that's going to address uh, if we can find a difference between reps and uh, weight progression on hypertrophy. But all of the indirect literature we have so far says it's almost certainly not going to find anything. Um, so people seem to think there's this kind of like a lot of um, our practices in bodybuilding and hypertrophy training are sort of inherited from weightlifting and powerlifting. And there, adding weight is better than adding reps because the point is to get stronger as much weight as you can. Nobody gives a shit how many you know sets of 10 you did in the squat. They care what your squat max is. They care what your clean and jerk max is. So we've sort of inherited that and people think, oh, adding weight's good, adding weight's good. It is good, but adding reps within a certain range in the five to 30 rep range is probably just as good, right? So there's no magic. Um, 
However, on the downside of progressing in load, sometimes it's problematic to add load. Let's say you have a 10 pound dumbbell and the next uh, dumbbell up is 15 pounds. You're doing side laterals and you're doing sets of 10 to 20. Let's say you're going from, you know, you've done a set of uh, 12 in side laterals with a 10 pounders. Do you use the 15 pounders next week? Are you crazy? You'll do a set of four. That's way out of your rep range. It's probably dangerous for your shoulder joints to be lifting that heavy in an isolation movement. So sometimes the weight jumps are so big, rep jumps are the only way to go. So you might do the 10s for 12 and then 13 and then 14 and then 15 and then deload and then go 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then finally, when you're doing the 10s for like sets of 20 or multiple sets above 15 reps, like 21, 17, 15, 15, 14, stuff like that. Then you go to the 15s and start hitting, you know, 10, 11 reps with them, something like that. And then start again, adding reps to work up through that range, right? So that's definitely a possibility. Progression and load is not a religion we're following. It's just a good progression tool. Progression and reps is the other option, right? Same idea here. So I'm not going to belabor these points. You can read them if you want to pause this lecture. Um, if you don't add something, RIR stalls, it goes up. So if you do a set of 10 with 100 kilos uh, in week one at 3 RR, the same uh, same set of 10, again, is just 4 RR. It's not really good. But if you add reps, uh, you can lower the RIR or keep it stable. So for example, if you do 100 kilos instead of for 10, you do it for 11 next week. That's same RIR. So it's good, stable. Or you can even lower it to 2 RIR if you do something like 12 reps. So it's really good. Uh, rep additions are excellent for hitting RIR. So it's in almost every way as good as weight additions with some exceptions. When dumbbell weights and other weights jump by really big fractions, sometimes even the pull down or the tricep push down, the plates are like 10 pounds at a time. And if you're like doing push downs with 50 pounds, jumping to 60 is the equivalent of like doing 500 pounds of squat one week and then going to 600 the next week. That's kind of insane, right? So a bunch of different machines and dumbbells, especially have a situation where uh, rep additions are almost mandatory because weight additions would throw you way outside of your rep range, right? Um, rep additions are prohibitive in sets of 30 plus reps. So like, uh, just like we mentioned, if you go above 30 reps in a set, adding reps is just doing more work. It's probably not simulating any more hypertrophy. And uh, they definitely have their limitations when you're crossing rep ranges. Like we mentioned, you know, if you said you're going to do the 10 to 20 range, but now you're doing sets of 21, 22, 23, you're really just not doing what you said you were, and it's time to add load. Um, and the one caveat here about rep additions is you can really get into them, and, and it starts to be really awesome. Uh, and you can say, man, like, you know, I can just keep the weight the same and add the reps. It gives me confidence. I don't have to like strain my tissues as much. I think this is a really good way to train. I can milk it out. I can really get sort of used to lifting one weight for a long time, get a build a bunch of work capacity. It's kind of safe way to do that and build a bunch of volume. And all of a sudden, like when I increase the load later, I can sort of go through that process again. It's totally cool, except you gotta remember that sometimes, especially when reps are very low, uh, rep additions are way, way more powerful, way bigger fractions of the total workload than weight additions or the load additions, and it can get you into some trouble with fatigue accumulation and injuries. For example, if you're squatting 480 pounds for, like, say, uh, sets of uh, six or something like that, right, um, then you have 480, uh, you do 485 the next week, that's uh, 1.01 times the volume. Very, very tiny progression, super manageable. Like, if you did 480, for six uh, in a leg press, next week someone said, you know, you recovered pretty well. So do you think you could do 485 for six or for seven? You're like, or for or rather for six again? And be like, yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ, I might not even notice that weight increase, right? Unless unless fatigue accumulation is really crazy high or I was pushing all the way to failure, I should almost certainly be able to get that no problem. On the other hand, let's say, you know, you heard somewhere in RP Plus that rep and weight progressions are almost equivalent. You said, okay, instead of, I'm gonna do 480, and instead of going to 485, I'm going to do 480, and I'm going to go from six reps to seven reps. Okay, add a rep. It's just you're like, well, whatever, add five pounds or add a rep. Who cares? Same thing. Uh, that is an increase in 1.16 times the volume. That is 16 times the volume increase by adding a rep than by adding five pounds on the bar for weight. 16 times. So what you're saying is if you successfully add from six reps to 10 reps in a mesocycle with 480 pounds, and someone goes from 480 to 495 or something, and they're like, I did great. You did way better than them, but you also put yourself at much higher risk. Put it this way, if someone goes from 480 to 495 for sets of six in the leg press, call me impressed, that's good progress. If someone goes from sets of six to sets of 10 
in the leg press at 480, holy crap, that's a different lifter. Those are different size quads because every single jump was basically 16 times the magnitude of the weight jump if they jump by reps. Be careful jumping by reps. So if it works, it works. Just have some um, reverence for it. Understand that with low rep sets, jumping by reps is a big task. Going up by a rep when sets are between 5 and 10 and even 5 and 15 reps is a thing. When you start jumping on reps between sets of 15 and sets of 25, it's really kind of equivalent to jumping by weight. And sometimes when you jump by reps from 25 to 30, the rep increments can be even smaller than weight increments, especially based on how much weight you're lifting, which can have an advantage, right? So just keep all that in mind. All right, those are pretty easy progressions. Now progressing in sets. A little bit more complicated, but as we'll see, it filters down to something that's not super over the top. When you start a mesocycle, you probably want to start right around your minimum effective volume. We already figured out how to start minimum effective volume in the last lecture, but a quick review is, did the session give you a pump? Did you feel like you had to make a challenging effort? And did the session make you sore? And you can rank these on a zero to two point scale. So like no pump at all is zero points. Okay pump is one point. Great pump is two points. Same idea for uh, session effort and for soreness. Add all these numbers together. This is the exact algorithm you can use. It's a great one. If you totaled zero to one, then you're under your minimum effective volume. You should probably be doing more volume by a little bit. If you totaled in this uh, in the system, in this algorithm, if you totaled between two and four points, then you're probably around your MEV, you're pretty close. And if you went five or six, then you're probably over your MEV. How do you go five or six? Let's imagine what six is. Six means you score a two point on every single one of these. That means you got a great pump, you felt like it was a ton of work, and you got sore for a few days or more. That's not MEV, that's over MEV for most people, right? Does that make sense? So if you look at this, it makes a ton of sense. Get to your MEV, and then we have another whole algorithm, the RP patented set progression algorithm. It's uh, gonna be in the RP uh, hypertrophy book. And here it is. It asks you two questions, and there's a one to four ranking scale for each one, and then you analyze the results after. So you hit your MEV, and you're asking the question of how do I progress? How do I add sets from here? Do I add sets from here, right? So in the second week, you alter your training via this algorithm. Question for the first session that you did, how sore did you get? First answer is you didn't get sore at all. Second answer is you got stiff for a few hours or whatever, maybe a bit sore, but by the next day you were healed way in advance of your session for that muscle group. Number three is you got delayed onset muscle soreness, but it healed just on time for your next session. So you weren't sore when you were trying to train. And number four is you got DOMS and it wasn't healed and you had to train when you were sore in the next session. Okay. And then what about performance? Number one option is you hit your target reps two RIR or more above what was planned for that week, or you had to do two more extra reps to match planned RIR. What does that mean? That means, let's say you were trying to hit a set of 10. You hit a set of 10 last week and you increased the weight by five pounds and you're like, oh, I brought a set of 10, should put me at the same RIR. Except instead of that happening, you hit a set of 10 and you were supposed to hit two RIR, let's say, or three RIR, and it was legit five RIR. You're like, oh, okay, that was too easy. And then the next set, you're like, I'm going to push as many reps as I need to to get to the, the three RIR that I want. And you end up doing 12 reps instead of 10 right? That is way, way easy. Your performance has elevated significantly from last week, okay? So keep that in mind. Option number two is um, you basically hit uh, right around the performance that you were expecting. So you hit your target reps at RIR planned or one above, maybe it'll do a little bit better, or you had to do no extra reps to hit your target RIR or maybe just one extra rep. So like you did 100 pounds last week, now you're doing 105, you did 12 reps last week at RIR three, this week, you hit uh, RER3, but it was like 12 reps or 13 reps or something. So pretty close to matching performance. Um, and then number three is uh, you hit your target reps, but the reps in reserve were a bit lower than expected. So we can't say this is a reduction in performance because it's technically not, but we suspect we're getting damn close to one. So for example, you had 100 pounds for 10 reps last week, 105 pounds this week, you're expecting 10 reps. You hit two RIR last week, this week, to get those 10 reps, you had to go one RIR. So you're like, uh, okay, I thought it was going to be two RIR. Or let's say you were expecting one RIR. You actually had to go to failure, zero RIR, to hit all those 10 reps. Technically, you're not underperforming because you still match your performance. But you're damn close, so we're going to have something to say about that in a second. 
Number four is real straightforward. That's our little MRV detector. You couldn't match your last week's reps, no matter what RIR you did, right? We did 100 pounds for 10 reps last week. This week you did 105 for six, <laughs> okay? You just shit the bed, right? And this wasn't six because you stopped four IR short. It was six because you went to failure and you just did six and that's all you could do, right? All right, so here's where the algorithm, we asked ourselves these questions. They're pretty straightforward, not a ton of wiggle room here. If you get a one on both, so you didn't get sore at all, and your performance was excellent, exceptional, you probably add something like two to three sets to that session next week. Like imagine doing uh, three sets of chest press. You get literally just no soreness at all. And the next week on chest press, you were like, I could do this forever, right? Then your volume in that last session was probably just not a lot. And in that next session, you should probably add some volume. Uh, and uh, it's probably a really good idea. So basically, what ends up happening is you add two or three sets. So you did three sets of chest press, maybe you go up to five, right? You could go to four, but that could still not be enough because you were so way ahead of the curve. Chances are you were so understimulated, it's okay to add a bit more sets than usual. You're not going to score a lot of ones on both. Sometimes it'll usually be like ones or two. So if you do a one or two or a two on both, that means you're doing really well and you're certainly recovering on time, but you're recovering on pace. We want to progress in sets. So we just add like one set to the next session, for example. So you did four sets of, of chest press last time. You know, you get a little bit sore or not sore, but you know, performance this time or the next chest exercise you did, uh, sorry, next chest workout you did, you know, your performance is good, but not, uh, you're not amazing. Uh, uh, it's just like you, you hit all your numbers, but you know, if you pushed it harder, you would be really fatigued. It's okay. I'm going to add one set. I think I'm going to be able to adapt at that speed and gain hypertrophy there. If you get a three on performance, okay, at all, uh, or a three or four on soreness at all, uh, then you don't want to add sets for the next week. So three on performance, remember, is like you hit your target reps, but you uh, had a lower RER than expected. So you sort of were like, ooh, I mean, I got the work done, but damn, like I had to push it harder than I thought. Clearly that amount of volume from last week, uh, was already like close to where you could recover from, adding any would be stupid because you'd probably exceed your MRV. So you're just gonna keep your volume the same. Eight sets of chest fucked you up pretty well last week so that this week you barely got the work in. Just do eight sets of chest this week. Don't don't get Napoleonic and try to go too far. And then three or four on soreness means like if you just recover, so for example, you did eight sets of chest and by the next workout for you know an incline bench where you did flat, you got eight sets of flat bench, eight sets of incline bench a couple days later, you just barely recovered from soreness. Don't go up in volume because you just barely recovered. Let's just, okay, let's check that. Okay, it's good. We're going to keep this volume. If our soreness really is much easier next week, then we can start to add volume. But if you're just barely recovering, don't assume that you could just add volume and be totally good, right? Not a, not a really good idea. And if it's a four, which means there was overlapping soreness, that doesn't mean we have to go back and reduce volume like crazy, but we certainly can't add any volume. Now, easy one is four on performance. If you get a four on performance, especially two sessions in a row, you need some kind of volume reduction. You need a recovery session, a recovery half week, a deload, something, because you are by definition over your MRV. Pause this video, take a real deep look through this algorithm. Once the RP uh, hypertrophy book comes out in 2020, maybe if you watch this, it's already 2020, um, then you're gonna see that and it's gonna be very, very well explained. This is a really, really awesome way to program training because it really just mathematically tells you when to go up, when to go down based on your body's responses. Pretty neat, pretty neat. If all this sounds really complicated, you're like, oh my God, algorithms, math, fuck that. I don't want to do a rating scale every time. And we're going to super simplify it for you. If you're recovering ahead of schedule, like you're not as sore as you thought, and your performance is super awesome, add sets. If you're recovering on schedule, which you're just recovering from soreness pretty well, but not, you know, just a day or two in advance, of where you're supposed to be. And if your performance is on track, but not crazy, then um, you probably just don't add sets. You keep it as it is, because this is really, really good training, but close to your limits, so you don't want to push the boundaries. You add reps, you add weight to get to your RIRs, but you don't add sets. And if you're under recovering and you're not performing to where you need to be, then you probably need to take a recovery session, recovery half week or a deload to reduce all that fatigue and then slowly start building back up from there, right? As far as implications from training, here it is. First of all, you don't progress for no reason right? You progress to keep the sessions as stimulative as possible. 
in the context of knowing that your accumulation length needs to be a decent length and you can't take too much too soon. Okay. Great sessions with a little bit of an eye for the future to have future great sessions as well. That's the purpose of progression, right? So if the sessions are too easy for their time in the mezzo, then you probably add load or reps or sets or all of them to make them more difficult. If they're a bit too hard, you stop adding so that your body's adaptations can catch up and the workload can be sustainable again. And if they're way too hard where you can't perform them, you back off, you reduce fatigue, take some recovery days, and then you restart the progression from there. Quick example here, last slide. For programming recommendations, it's just a sample progression. Pause the video on your own time and just look through this because I, I can explain some of this, but it's really kind of apparent. You just need to like sort of look at it for a little bit. So for example, this I think illustrates every kind of progression we talked about. We got uh, week one, week two, week three. And this doesn't mean we end at week three, just, just a sample here. We got two sessions. So for barbell row, for the top exercise, first exercise in the two sessions, look at the sets. We have week one, we have two sets. Week three, we have three sets. Week, uh, sorry, week two, we have three sets. We three, we have four sets. So we're going up in sets. Let's see what's happening with weight. 185 pounds in the first week, 190 on the second week, 195 on the third. Cool. Just a sample. That doesn't mean you need to go up by five. You need to do the analysis and see how much you need to go by to hit my RIRs, right? And there's the RIRs. We go RIR three, RIR two, RIR one. Sounds really good. And then what about the reps? In this case, because we're increasing the weight, and the sets, seemingly we're hitting the RIRs we want without having to progress in reps for the first two weeks. So it's eight and seven reps, then it's eight, seven, six, right? Just matching, which is super great. And then the last week, let's say it's week three, let's say we deload after, we can do nine, seven, six, because we want that RIR one, right? It's all about hitting those target RIRs. It's, it's really, really important. And then we have, uh, the next example is a giant set of pull-ups. The G means as many, uh, many sets as it takes to get however man, many reps we want. So we have a weight of, uh, what was it? Oop, that's a typo. <laughs> um, the weight says three, it should be zero, right? So zero weight, zero weight, zero weight every single time. We're not adding uh, any weight to our body. We're just doing pull-ups. Uh, we are doing 30 reps total on the first week, 35 reps total on the second week, 40 reps total on the last week, and the, our reps in reserve is two and two and two. So we're just doing uh, as many sets as it takes to get two reps in reserve every single time, adding them up and and, and getting all that together. And then let's see what a good one is. Aha, here's the last example I'll do. And then you can look at session two by yourself. Pull downs, last exercise on session one, the sets go two sets, two sets, three sets. So that's to reflect that we don't always increase on sets, right? It's auto regulation. And the weight here stays the same every single time. 110 pounds, 110 pounds, 110 pounds. Remember I said that sometimes the plate stacks, 110 to 120 is a big distance sometimes, would really throw off your reps. So what do you do here? Instead of increasing the weight, in order to keep the there's RR here is two, then one, then zero. So something's getting harder, right? What are we doing? Well, the reps are 25 and 15 in the first week, 26 and 16 in the second week, then 27, 17, and 14 in that last week, meaning we're adding reps. Take a look at the other examples here. It's not rocket science. It's just about making things a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder to do two things, make our workouts good every single time we step in the gym and restrain ourselves enough so that we can have future good workouts later in the mesocycle. Folks, see you next time. Our next lecture in Advanced Hypertrophy Concepts will be the Stimulus to Fatigue Ratio. Spooky! It's close to Halloween when we're recording this, so everything is a spooky theme. Folks, see you later.